Hey everybody, Pastor Greg here. I'm excited about life and I know that you are too. Why? Because life is so, so, so good and it keeps getting better all the time. I know that many of you, your hearts are, are broken. I know that many of you are just concerned and even devastated by the news that is coming to us about our dear brothers and sisters on the beautiful island of Puerto Rico. And I want you to know that we at CSC, our hearts are with all of you, my brothers and sisters that are there in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And we have joined with two other New Thought centers to do something, to be the God experience, to be a tangible uh, service to our brothers and sisters. And so what we are doing, we've created a caravan of love where we're going to be taking donations and actually getting them on a ship that will be going to Puerto Rico. Uh, there's more details that will be coming, but for those of you that are not in the area, if you want to support these efforts, you can go to this website celebrationsc.org forward slash PR. There you can click the link to volunteer if you're local to the area and if you're not you can click the donation option there and donate funds that will support us in the shipping costs and the operational costs that are necessary in order to get these items to our brothers and sisters. We are so excited to continue to be the God experience in this way. We truly know and believe that we are here to serve all creation and we are happy to serve our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico at this time in their time of need. We have have a new message series. It's October and I have a powerful message in store for you. Let's get into it. The reason why it feels so good, the reason why it feels so good to talk about God in this way is because you and God are one. And so you, as you acknowledge the beauty of this thing we call God in truth, you are acknowledging your own beauty. As you are acknowledging this unconditionally loving presence, you are acknowledging the unconditionally loving presence that lives, moves, and has its being in you just as you live, move, and have your being in it. You are beautiful because the God in you is beautiful. You are powerful because the God in you is powerful. You are brilliant because the God in you is brilliant. You are amazing because the God within you is amazing. As we come to this understanding that this power that permeates all life is beautiful, our life begins to shift and transform because then we expect to see beauty in our own lives. We expect to see beauty in our homes. We expect to see beauty in our families. We expect, expect to see beauty in the workplace because there is no spot where God is not. Yes, yes. Thank you, Soul 21. Thank you, Soul 21. Well, we're going to get right in. I have a few things that I want to talk about this morning. As you know, our message series this month, Stay Woke, The Path of Self-Realization. And as we are looking at the life of Paramahansa Yogananda and as he has shared so much in, in much great detail about his life, I encourage each and every one of you to get the book. If you've never read it, uh, if you've read it uh, once, revisit it. Uh, maybe do as, as I've done, although I've read the book many times, I decided, since we were doing this series, I decided to grab the audio book, which has been awesome. It's narrated by Ben Kingsley. And uh, so you could do that. You could do something different. But I encourage you, whether you've read it before or have never read it, uh, it takes you through a powerful journey. Uh, he starts at the beginning of his life, which is where we're going to begin today and, and possibly next week as well. We'll deal with some of his childhood. What's interesting about childhood stories, I, I think that for many of our great leaders and teachers, we want to know and hear or have some kind of fantastic origin story about their life. You know, we want to have this glimpse that something about them was special even before they knew who and what they were. That's the root of why we have all learned as, as citizens of the United States the story of George Washington. Right, the story of I cannot tell a lie and the, and the chopping of the cherry tree. It's, it's rooted in that tradition that he who is considered the father of this country and of course the first president um, required some sort of origin story. And we have that, that story. If you look into the life of Jesus um, in, in the canonized scripture, we don't really get much about his, his time as a child. But if you look outside of the canonized scripture and go to the Gnostic texts, uh, there are what's known as the infancy gospels, which I love, the infancy gospels. They're, they're fun to read. And the reason being is because you get all of these stories about Jesus that many of us have never heard. 
In one of those stories, uh, we find Jesus as a little boy. He was already doing miracles. And it was on the Sabbath, and it was forbidden during the Sabbath to, to work or do anything and also to perform miracles, which never makes sense, right? <laughs> God will not allow you to perform miracles on the Sabbath. But Jesus being Jesus, little Jesus, he, uh, <laughs> little Jesus, baby Jesus, he, um, he went to a river, and, and the river, the water was, was dirty, and it wasn't drinkable, and he began to purify the water. And then after purifying the water, he began to take some of the, the, the mud and, and, and form it into clay, and he made these clay figurines um, of sparrows. And so, you know, he was a kid. He was basically making his own toys, right, and having a fun time and doing these things. Well, somebody saw little Jesus doing what he wasn't supposed to do. So they went to Joseph. They said, Joseph, do you know what your son is doing? He's performing all these miracles on the Sabbath. Go talk to your son. <laughs> I can only imagine what Joseph and Mary had to go through on a consistent basis with that little boy. And so Joseph, I can imagine he was probably like, oh, Lord, not again. Let me go talk to this boy. So he went to talk to Jesus and basically said to Jesus, you know, people are talking, you can't do this stuff. You know, the Sabbath, you can't perform miracles. And Jesus got annoyed. And so he took all of those, those toy sparrows and turned them into real birds. And they started flying <laughs> through the air. And he said to the birds, remember me. Remember it was I that brought you into being. And you can go in the infancy gospels. It's literally very short, maybe four to five lines of just scene after scene after scene of all of these things that Jesus did. Um, uh, in the infancy gospels. And so then we have in the autobiography of a yogi, Yogananda shares some stories about what he did as a little boy before he came into the full knowing of who and what he is and came into the full knowing of the destiny that was in front of him to come to the West and bring these teachings, to bring yoga to the West. He, although there were other teachers that had come to the West, um, for him, this was the, he was the first teacher to actually come and live and stay in the West. And so a lot of the vocabulary and things that we know and look at and are just normal things for us, even yoga uh, itself, uh, we can point back and look to the time that he came as the time that began to make that uh, just sort of a common experience. So he tells the story of him and his older sister, Uma. And she had a, a boil on her leg and she needed some ointment. And so he said, give me some of that ointment. And he put it on his arm. And he, she said, why are you putting this ointment on your arm? You're not the one with the boil. I am. And he said, tomorrow I'm going to have a boil on my arm. And your, your boil is going to be 10 times bigger. Right? And so she was like, you know, his name, by the way, is Mukunda. Before he became and transformed into Paramahansa Yogananda, his name was Mukunda. And so she said, Mukunda, you know, you're crazy. And why would you want to do that anyway? Well, the next day. His sister awakened, and her boil had grown significantly. And he found a boil on the very spot that he rubbed the ointment on. And his sister was very afraid. She went to their mother and said, Mother Makunda has become a necromancer, right? She was afraid of him. And at that moment, <laughs> at that moment, Yogananda writes this. Gravely, mother instructed me never to use the power of words for doing harm. I have always remembered her counsel and followed it. My boil was surgically treated. A noticeable scar left by the doctor's incision in present, is present today. On my right forearm is a constant reminder of the power in man's sheer word. Those simple and apparently harmless phrases to Uma, spoken with deep concentration, had possessed sufficient hidden force to explode like bombs and produce definite, thought injurious effects. I understood later that the explosive vibratory power in speech could be wisely directed to free one's life from difficulties and thus operate without scar or rebuke. And so as a young boy, he was about eight years old at that time, he learned that you could speak a thing and so it shall be with deep conviction because he actually, the thing was, he was upset with his sister because she didn't believe he could do it. And so he matched his thought with emotion, yes, yes. His desire or belief, he desired to bring that thing into being and he manifested it. Later on, he tells a story. How many are familiar with the, um, the book or the movie, The, the Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini? Um, Hosseini? And if you know that story, I, I was never really familiar with, with this, this fun and this game. But um, the idea of the, the kite runner, you have the young boys, Amir and Hassan. And what 
uh, kids would do, and even adults, they would, it's called kite fighting, where you actually have uh, knives or sharp ar objects on the, the string of your kite, and in the air you fight and try to, try to cut the cord of the opposing uh, person's kite, and it would fall to the ground. Now, in the kite runner, what was interesting is Hassan was significant because he was, uh, he would work with his friend Amir. He would know where the kite was going to fall, no matter what. And that's what made him such a brilliant kite runner. He knew where to go to get that kite, even though it was way up in the sky. How, how could he determine exactly where it was going to fall? He always knew. He could always grab that kite. Well, interestingly, Yogananda tells a story about him and his sister observing some kite running. And... He, at this moment, had, had come into an experience with the Divine mo Mother, uh, the Divine Mother as embodied through the goddess Kali. And he, was, he had fallen so in love with this relationship with the Divine Mother, and he was saying to his sister that, you know, I just love that the Divine Mother can bring me whatever it is that I want. And she said, oh, yeah? Well, if that's true, then can, can the Divine Mother bring you one of those kites that we're watching in the air? Now, again, just as in the story with the kite runner, you don't know where these kites are going to fall. But he said, um, an unequivocal conviction came over me. That fulfillment would crown any of my prayers uttered in that sacred spot. Standing there with Uma one day, I watched two boys flying kites over the roofs of two buildings that were separated from my house. And she goes on, she asks him, what is he doing? And again, she says, I suppose that the Divine Mother would give you the two kites. My sister laughed defense derisively. And I said, why not? I began silent prayers for their possession. And what do you think happened? The first kite, the string was chopped. And again, the kite is in the air. It could fall anywhere. The wind could take it anywhere. But he watched the wind just blow the kite to him and blow the kite to him. And then there was a cactus that was just nearby and the kite got caught on the cactus, and he easily and effortlessly walked and got the kite. And his sister said, oh, well, you know, that's just a coincidence. You can't, if it's two kites, then I'll believe that you indeed have a relationship with the Divine Mother. And, of course, he stood in that conviction, knowing the truth and knowing that he had a relationship with the all that is. And it would bring to him whatever it is that he desired. And so that second kite came and got caught on the same cactus. And he had the two kites. And, of course, his sister was dismayed and ran away in fear. <laughs> now, we hear these stories, these cute stories, whether we're talking about George Washington, whether we're talking about Jesus, whether we're talking about Yogananda, and we recognize the innocence of a child, right? We recognize that children just know things. They, they're, not, they're not bothered by all of the things of the world, and so they can see life clearly. Their connection to the non-physical is still very strong, and we call that childlike faith. Yes, yes? We even hear in Scripture, Jesus writes, and, or says, rather, uh, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter the realm of everlasting good. You have to have this thing that we call childlike faith. Well, what I want to submit to you today is that that child still exists within each and every one of you. That child that still knows the truth, that child that just like Yogananda, that knew it had a divine connection, that the divine mother, that the divine father would bring any and everything to him or to you, you have that same connection. You are always innocent, just like those innocent children that I just described. There is always something within you that is calling you home, calling you back to that place of innocence. Now, as I heard those stories, I thought about my own stories, and I'm sure you all have your own stories. My parents like to tell the, the, the stories of, of when I was a young child, um, yeah, younger than about five years old, my, my ESP and intuition was heightened. And so uh, there were a lot of things that I knew, um, things that I could see and describe. Pastor Yolanda has talked about her experiences as a child, and I know many of you have those experiences. Your connection was just there. Um, similar to, to Yogananda's sister, my uncle in particular was, was scared of me because I was like, don't make that boy say nothing else, you know, <laughs> right? And we recognize that, you know? But the other thing I recognize is we all have that, that story, right? And we all recognize and have heard stories about how we were connected or, you know, it may just have seemed like a random coincidence, but in truth, it was the connection that you still have today. For many of us, we also have the stories of our loss of innocence. If you're like me, maybe it's just me. Stories where you were 
maybe exposed to something that you shouldn't have been exposed to and it shifted you in some way. Stories where you may have been violated or abused and it changed the trajectory of your path because you lost contact and connection with this innocence that is always there. There may have been some adults in your life who were broken themselves who did not know the truth of themselves, had lost contact with their own innocence. And so how could they actually lead you and guide you in remaining in your innocence and remaining in your connection? Am I talking to somebody in the room today? Some of us, because of the experiences in our lives, we had to grow up fast. And so we lost our innocence. But the truth of life is that you're always innocent. The beauty of life is that even, even with those experiences, even with those experiences, for me, I, I, I can remember uh, an, an experience that I was about six years old. And from that day on, it shifted things in my mind. I remember not ever really getting in trouble, not thinking I was bad, not thinking I was wrong. But an experience happened for me, an experience of violation. That after that experience, then I began to get in trouble. Because there was something that shifted in my mind that I thought I was bad. Then all of a sudden, I became, I started lying to my parents. Doing all these things that I wasn't doing before. Why? Because I thought that I was wrong. I thought that I was bad. And I forgot that I was always innocent. I'm here to tell you, if nobody tells you, because I know it to be true, you're still innocent. I'm here to speak to that child within you that had to grow up too fast. I'm here to speak to that child within you that wasn't loved in the way that you wanted to be loved because the elders in your life, they, they, they just didn't have it. They did the best that they could with what they knew. We bless, we honor, we love them. But your innocence remains. Now, A Course in Miracles says it this way. One, it says you remain as God created you. That's another way of saying you're always innocent. But if we go deeper and if we look in the workbook, in the section of what is the Christ, it says this. Christ is God's son as he created him. He is the self we share, uniting us with one another and with God as well. He is the thought which still abides within the mind that is his source. He has not left his holy home nor lost the innocence in which he was created. He abides unchanged forever in the mind of God. So what this means is that there's a presence within you. We call it the Christ. There's a presence within you. You can call it the Christ consciousness. There's a presence within you. We can call it love itself. There's a presence within you. You can call it your divine self. There's a presence within you. You can just call it power. Peace, ease. That presence is your eternal connection to your holy home. That presence is your eternal connection to your innocence. Speak to that child right now within yourself. Put your hand on your heart and say, I am always innocent. I am always innocent. I remain as God created me. I am always innocent. Now, the course goes even deeper. If we look at chapter 3, the the title of that chapter is Retraining the Mind. And in this section of the atonement without sacrifice, it talks about innocence. And it says this, innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil, which does not exist. It is, however, perfectly aware of everything that is true. Your innocence is perfectly aware of everything that is true. So these experiences outside of you, it's not the truth. And the reason why we can say it's the truth, it's not that it didn't happen. We know it was an experience. But the thing about life is the external life, it's constantly changing. It's the effect world. It changes over and over because it's like a movie being projected onto a screen. But the truth, if it is true, can, has, it can never change. It has to be unwavering. It has to be completely reliable. If the truth changes, you can't bank on it, right? This is why we're able to fly into space and put space and, and even fly in the air because there are truth principles that are the same no matter what. 
These principles of flight are the same whether you're in Japan, whether you're in South America, whether you're in the United States. These things are the same all the time. That's what a truth has to be. Because if it was only true in the United States, then you can only fly in the United States. If it was only true in Japan, then you could only fly in Japan. Similarly, spiritual truths, they must be true no matter what. They can't change. And even in spite of the experience that you may have had, again, the violation, the abuse, the having to grow up too fast, the being exposed to something that you really shouldn't have been exposed to at that age, you've had other experiences in your life. You've had other experiences to prove and to show to you that life does change, that life doesn't have to look the same. But the ultimate truth is that your innocence is perfectly aware of everything that is true. You're worthy. Everything that is true. You remain as God created you. You were created perfect, whole, holy, healed, and complete. That's how you were created. You remain that. And so when we go back to this section, this idea of Christ as God's son, as God created him, it's the self that we share uniting us with one another and with God. This holy self, this innocent self, it lives in you and it lives in me and we share that. So the reason that I can affirm your innocence today is because the innocence that I'm affirming and knowing in me is the innocence that I'm affirming and knowing in you. It's our connection. And so, if no, again, if nobody's ever told you this and you've had experiences in your life, I'm standing here to tell you and Pastor Yolanda is here to tell you we've had experiences too. We've had experiences that should have completely broken us. But we're standing here now because our innocence remembers everything that is true. And one day our innocence told us that we were holy. One day our innocence told us that we are not our mistakes. One day our innocence told us that we are not our experiences. One day our innocence told us that we are not someone else's opinion of us. One day our innocence told us that we were safe. One day our innocence told us that we were secure. One day our innocence told us that there's a beautiful God that loves us unconditionally. One day our innocence told us that we have access to unconditional love no matter what, wherever we are. And so I want to close, and I want to close with this passage from Yogananda in the autobiography of a yogi. In this passage, he's talking about the law of miracles. And what he's talking about is how we can live our lives once we understand that we're always innocent. Because you see, this path of self-realization, staying woke, is about living powerfully on the earth. Your masters, spiritual masters. And self-realization is not about sitting in the mountain in the Himalayas and omen for the rest of your life. That's not what it's about. But it's about demonstrating this beautiful power, this force of love that's within you and being the example so we can all see it. So that somebody that you encounter can be reminded that they're always innocent. And so he writes this. The law of miracles is operable by any man or woman who has realized that the essence of creation is light. Now that's powerful already. We affirm that we are the light of the world. When you understand that the essence of creation is light, you can affect powerful change. And then he goes on. At night, man enters the state of dream consciousness and escapes from the false egoistic limitations that daily hem him, hem him round. In sleep, he has an ever-recurrent demonstration of the omnipotence of his mind. Lo, in the dream, appear in, his, appear in his dream long dead friends, the remotest continents, the resurrected scenes of his childhood. You hear what he's saying? When we go to sleep, we can dream, we can do anything. We dream that we're flying, we dream that we're all over the world. Uh, our, our loved ones that we haven't seen in years show up. We're demonstrating our power. And he goes on, he says, the free and unconditioned consciousness, the innocent, which all of us briefly experience in certain, uh, in, in certain of our dreams is the permanent state of a mind of a God-tuned master, innocent of all personal motives and employing the creative will bestowed on him or on us by the creator, a yogi rearranges the light atoms of the universe to satisfy any sincere prayer of a devotee. The state of mind of a God-tuned master. This is the innocent right here. 
Once you understand you're innocent, your tune can only be tuned to God. Your vibration can only be vibrating with the, the song of God. Your, 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 your life can only be an expression, an example of the very life and light of God. So stay woke to your innocence today. Stay woke to this eternal, everlasting connection that you are connected to your innocence, which is God. Stay woke to the truth that you remain as God created you. As this is the path of the great masters, as this is the path of the yogis, so it is your path. There's a guru that lives within you. Wake her up. There's a guru that lives within you. Wake him up. This is the path of self-realization. On that, I invite everybody to stand. Mm. The state of a God-tuned master. You are God-tuned masters. What we have done in this short time together is just adjusted our radio dial. That's all we did. We tuned out the news. We tuned out our Facebook feeds. We tuned out what our mama said. We tuned out what our coworkers said or did not do this week. <laughs> We tuned out the to-do list. We tuned out all of those things. And we turned our radio dial back to ourselves. We turned our television station, if you will, radio dial. We don't use radios much. Anymore. <laughs> we tuned our station back to the God vibration. Yes, yes. And when we tune to that station, what do we hear? We hear the word that we are always innocent. We hear the word that the God in you is speaking. My innocence is your innocence. My perfection is your perfection. My holiness and wholeness is your holiness and wholeness. See yourself today. See yourself as innocent. See yourself as separate from the events of your life. See yourself as invincible. See your eternal self. As you see your eternal self, you realize that even that experience looks like a speck on the timeline of your eternal existence. How dare we limit ourselves to one moment in time when time is timeless? As we embrace our innocence, we forgive ourselves and we set ourselves free. As we embrace our innocence, we forgive those that were in charge of our care, and we set them free. As we embrace our innocence, we, embra we embrace and we let go of any unforgiving thoughts that we have. We let go of the unforgiving thoughts because we realize we are innocent. We realize that although there was an experience, at our core, we are unchanged. For the core of our being is our divine self. We forgive ourselves and we set ourselves free right here and right now. And those that are willing in this moment, I invite you again to put your hand on your heart. As we affirm this word together, I am, I am always, innocent. always innocent. I remain, I remain as, God me. as God created me. I remain as love created me. I remain as joy created me. I am God's good idea. That has not changed. I am God's good idea. That has not changed. That has not changed. That has not changed. That has not changed. And to that we say amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, God.